Did you guys know that Stephanie Meyer rewrote the first Twilight but with everyone gender swapped? Hi guys and welcome back to my channel. So my parasocial best mate slash future adopted mother Stephanie Meyer rewrote the first Twilight book and swapped the genders. She basically wrote fan fiction of her own story. This is like I've I've accepted recently that I kind of begrudgingly love her for that she's unhinged it's and it's unparalleled you know it's hmm truly nobody loves anything as much as Stephanie Mayer loves her own book series and I don't know I kind of respect that hustle. This video is sponsored by G2A. G2A is a marketplace for digital products. G2A is a great place for anyone who wants to play video games but can't buy them at full price as much as they'd like to. Their huge catalogue features thousands of products across many regions. It's like Amazon but specifically for games and software. With games and gift cards there's something for everyone. G2A's catalogue includes utility software and subscription to streaming services. G2A has over 20 million customers worldwide and has sold over 100 million products. G2A is currently running a summer playground sale featuring Steam gift cards and Tinder gift cards for if you're feeling lonely this summer. So make sure you check out G2A using the special link in my description box www.g2a.com forward slash Elise. Thank you G2A for sponsoring today's video. So that's what we're looking at today. I went through Twilight, it's called Twilight Life and Death. Is it? I don't, I literally don't even know what's, the front cover of the original Twilight has a red apple. This one has a green, uh, I'll see what you did there. Well, yes, Twilight Life and Death, I don't even know what it's called. Also known as Life and Death, Twilight Reimagined. Okay, so before we actually start, I guess there's a few things. Number one, check out my documentary. Number two, check out my documentary merch. Number three, watch the documentary. Number four, buy my documentary merch. Number five, follow me on Instagram. I might just follow you back, probably won't. Number six, check out my podcast channel because by the time this video is out, the, uh, the podcast I'm talking about probably haven't been out yet, but I've recently done some well good podcast. I don't think they're out yet. <laughs> I don't think they're going to be. I'm trying to envision my work ethic over the next week. Hmm. Well, the one I, right, I've done two. And the next one that's coming out is with a journalist called Toby Muse. And it's about the cocaine cartels in Colombia. Right. Well, good. If I do say so myself, do, do you know why it was good? Because I got to talk about my favorite subject, which is drugs. And my second favorite subject, which is me on drugs. So it was good. So check out the Elise Yeezy show is my podcast channel. Cause some of you don't know that I have a podcast, which is hilarious to me. Anyway, for this review, usually I'll be like chapter one, chapter two, and I'll walk you through what's happened. However, we've already gone over Twilight. So if you've come to this video and you don't know what happened in the first book, please go watch like the three hour long video that I did almost two years ago about Twilight because I'm not hand-holding anyone, because it this is tested, this book is only 400 pages long and it has tested my sanity. My brain hates repetition. So I'm not going to be doing the whole, then this happened, unless it pertains to a quote that I've just said. The book is the same as the original, except the pronouns are swapped around. Forward, hello, lovely reader. Stop it, I'm blushing. You know, Bella, this is Steph Mayer talking, not just like some random person off the street. You know, Bella has always gotten a lot of censure for getting rescued on multiple occasions and people have complained about her being a typical damsel in distress. My answer to that has always been, Bella is a human in distress. A normal human being, this isn't like the only criticism that people have of Twilight Maya. She's really like cherry picked the criticisms and been like, right, which one can I handle? best. A normal human being surrounded on all sides by people who are basically superheroes and supervillains. She's also been criticised for being too consumed of her love interest as if that's somehow just a girl thing. But I've always maintained that it would have made no difference if the human were male and the vampire female. It's still the same story. Gender and species aside, Twilight has always been a story about magic and obsession and frenzy of first love. So I love this. She wrote this book out of spite in defiance of the criticism. I'm getting like choked up. I'm getting emotional. I love her. I think she would, I'm not sure if she's capable of hate. I don't think her good Mormon heart 
It's, <laughs> that's a thing to say. It's capable of hate. But I think if she met me, she would probably detest every cell in my body. But I love her for this because this it's so petty. I think making videos on the Twilight series has kind of corrupted my brain a little bit because I don't know why I suddenly have like this weird respect for her. And she says this, it would have made no difference if the human male and the vampire female. And yet, we'll get to the end, but this book is about 400 pages long. Twilight is over 500 pages long. First, their names, the gender swap names for Bella and Edward. And at first I think I got confused and I was thinking, right, so it's basically like, Edward's Bella and Bella's Edward. That, I don't think that made any sense. I had to remind myself continuously, no, it's meant to be Bella as a boy, not Bella as Edward and, <laughs> I'm an idiot. The names, Bo, as in Beaufort, Beaufort and Edith, but spelled E-D-Y-T-H-E, because Maya wants us to hate these people apparently. Like you really tested my patience throughout this, but thank goodness I love you. Yeah, Twilight Life and Death is a hundred pages shorter than the original Twilight because that's how much of the internal babbling that Bella does in comparison. So this whole thing of there's no difference if the human male and vampire, well clearly there is a difference. Clearly you think girls are whiny, Maya. Anyway. Any, everyone is gender swapped in this, except for Renee and Charlie, because Charlie and Renee, here's the reason for that. Beau was born in 1987. It was a rare thing for a father to get primary custody of a child in those days, even more so when the child was just a baby. Most likely, the mother would have had to be proven unfit in some way. I have a really hard time believing that any judge at the time, or even now, would give a child to a transient, unemployed father over a mother with a steady job and strong ties to her community. Babe, you have written about, like, shape-shifting werewolf people and vampires with magical venom sperm. You can take a bit of creative liberty here if you want. We're not going to Twilight for realism. There are many more changes in the writing than were necessitated by Bo's status as a male person. So I thought I would break them down for you. These are, of course, rough estimates. I did not count all the words I changed or do any actual maths. She's just giving us math for no reason. Like, am I back in school, babes? What's going on? Do you know, in my first year of college, what were the subjects I was gonna do? English, Lit and Lang, Philosophy, Psychology, or oh, something else. But I gave up with Psychology after a week because it was just like maths and stuff. I don't care about that. 5% of the changes I made were because Bo is a boy. 5% of the changes were made because Bo's personality developed just slightly different to Bella's. Yeah, worse. The biggest variations are that he's more OCD. He's not nearly so flowery with his words. That's where the 100 pages went missing. And thoughts, but he's, and he's not as angry. He's totally missing the chip Bella carries around on her shoulder all the time. 70% of the changes I made were because I was allowed to do a new editing run 10 years later. I got to fix almost every word that has bothered me since the book was printed and it was glorious. I don't know who asked, babe. I love you, but I don't know who asked. 5% were mythology issues, mistakes actually, mostly related to visions. As I continued into the sequels to Twilight and even Midnight Sun, where I got to look inside Alice's head with Edward, the way Alice's visions worked was refined. It's more mystical than Twilight, and looking at it now, there are ways she should have been involved and wasn't. Whoops. Whoops, I done goofed on my entire original series. Never change, never change. Thank you for reading. Thank you for being a part of this world. And thank you for being such an amazing and unexpected source of joy in my life for the last decade. You're welcome. Kiss, kiss, kiss. Now, onward. Preface. I'd never given much thought to dying, though I'd had reason enough in the last few months. But even if I had, I wouldn't have imagined it like this. Ugh. Oh. The preface is essentially the same. Chapter one, first sight. So imagine if I read this version and the original version side by side to know every single difference like Moss does in the episode of the IT crowd but with Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone to make sure that the children's edition and the adults edition are exactly the same in text. Unfortunately, I'm not that unhinged. Something even sadder happened. I know Twilight so well now that I knew when things were deviating. Not like the mine, like the most minor of Bo wearing a, what was he wearing? A Flight of the Concords. I've not included it. A Flight of the Concords shirt, I think, when he's at the airport in the beginning. I didn't include stuff like that because who cares, mate? I don't care. But we'll get to it, don't worry. My memory is just so good that I, and I know Twilight so well at this point that I knew when things were changing and then I could go to that exact bit, but in my other cop. Let's get on with it. 
Bo is leaving Phoenix for Forks. We know this. Oh, except Bo doesn't have brown eyes. He has blue eyes like Renesme. What a difference. Yet somehow I now found myself exiled to Forks for the rest of my high school education. A year and a half. 18 months. It felt like a prison sentence. 18 months hard time. When I slammed the car door behind me it made a sound like the clang of iron bars locking into place. Okay. Just a tad melodramatic there. I have an overactive imagination, as my mum was fond of telling me. And of course, this was my choice. Self-imposed exile. So he's less mopey than Bella. It then equals like less personality later on. I was sure there must have been a time, probably when I was still in diapers, that I wasn't in charge of the bills and paperwork and cooking and general level-headedness, but I couldn't remember it. So one of the biggest differences is um, Bo's a boy and he cooks for people. He cooks for his mum. He's been cooking for women in twilight a boy has been cooking for the women i know never thought i'd see the day that's stephanie mayer's little nod towards feminism there mom's great it's great to see you too dad i wasn't supposed to call him charlie to his face it is basically the exact same text that's good me that's what i forgot to say so the 10th year anniversary of twilight was coming up and she wanted steph wanted to originally release midnight sun for it i believe but midnight sun wasn't ready yet so not wanting to miss the 10 year anniversary she did this instead it literally is a fan fiction s cash cash grab it's i think it's brilliant i think it's genius like don't work harder work smarter steph heard that took that motto to heart F gender flip your characters release the same book Res i just realized i just realized if she's done this wait till el james like el james is going to do it to 50 shades of gray isn't she mm. we both understood that this question wasn't about my own personal happiness it was about whether i was shirking my responsibility to look after her this was the reason charlie'd never fought mum about custody he knew she needed me time for renee to grow up and sort her own life out there my foot caught on the lip of the exit door and the bag swung out and hit the guy trying to get in so he's a gary stew this guy tries to start a fight but stops once he sees charlie because Bo is a boy, the man folk just want to scrap all the time. That statement rings very true. We'll get to it. Billy Black has changed to Bonnie. Maybe if I'd been one of the cool kids, I could make this work for me. Come in all popular homecoming king styles, but there was no hiding the fact that I was not that guy. Not the football star, not the class president, not the bad boy on a motorcycle. Babe, is this the 80s? unlike the other guys i didn't have a ton of free time for hobbies i'm not like those other guys because i don't have hobbies Bo goes to school seriously though this wasn't a life and death situation oh i see what she did there it's like when in twilight they said what's the time oh, it's tw see what she did. you're not slick it was just high school it's not like anyone was going to bite me are you being ironic with me steph i'm so proud of you yes those are real tears in my eyes when the bell there's <laughs> tears in my eyes because i can't believe i'm reading twilight again and i'm gonna redo midnight sun i'm gonna redo that video just so i can go even more in depth like these ones with the screenshots and all like i love torturing myself what did i do in a past life for me to behave this way to myself i don't know when the bell rang a pale skinny girl with skin problems and hair black as an oil slick leaned across the aisle to talk to me you're both foot swan aren't you she gave off the vibe of an overly helpful chess clubs type so you know maya fixed fixed a bunch of stuff barely barely right blink and you miss it but she didn't fix this bella bow being a dick even the teachers are gender swapped. I don't know why. Now the Cullens. Here are the Cullens. There were three girls. One I could tell was super tall, even sitting down, maybe as tall as I was. Her legs went on forever. She looked like she might be the captain of the volleyball team and I was pretty sure you wouldn't want to get in the way of one of her spikes. What's a spike? She had dark curly hair pulled back into a messy ponytail. Another had hair the colour of honey hanging to her shoulder. She was not quite as tall as the brunette, but was still probably taller than most of the guys at my table. There was something intense about her, edgy. It was kind of weird, but for some reason she made me think of this actress I'd seen in an action movie a few weeks ago, who took down a dozen guys with a machete. What are you talking about? You're talking about Kill Bill? I remembered thinking then that I didn't buy it. There was no way the actress could have taken on that many bad guys and what? Why? Why not? Hmm? Why not? Big old sexist. But I thought now that I might have bought it all if the character had been played by this girl. The last girl was smaller, with hair somewhere between red and brown, but different than Eva. A kind of metallic somehow, a bronzy colour. She looked younger than the other two, who could have been in college, easy. The two guys were opposites. The taller one, who was definitely taller than me, I'd guess 6'5 or even more, was clearly the school's star athlete and the prom king. 
and the guy who always had dibs on whatever equipment he wanted in the weight room. His straight gold hair was wound into a bun on the back of his head, but there was nothing feminine about it. Somehow it made him look even more like a man. What? What am I reading? Steph probably fainted the first part of the time, like she saw a hipster in a... Is it called a man bun? What were those... Oh, I don't know, doesn't matter. He was clearly too cool for this school or any other I could imagine. The shorter guy was wiry, his dark hair buzzed so short it was just a shadow across his scalp. So this is the gender swapped Cullens. I stared because their faces, so different, so similar, were all insanely, inhumanly beautiful. The guys and the girls both, beautiful. They were faces you never saw in real life, just airbrushed in magazines and on billboards, or in a museum painted by an old master as the face of an angel. It was hard to believe they were real. I decided the most beautiful of all was the smaller girl with the bronze coloured hair, though I expected the female half the student body would vote for is the movie star blonde guy. They would be wrong, though. I mean, all of them were gorgeous, but the girl was something more than just beautiful. She was absolutely perfect. It was an upsetting, disturbing kind of perfection. It made my stomach uneasy. Boy Alice, who's called Archie, still like dances around for movement. He muttered his answer under his breath. Those are the Cullens and the Hales. Edith and Eleanor Cullen. Jessamine and Royal Hale. The one who left was Archie Cullen. They live with Dr. Cullen and her husband. They go to science. Edith freaks out over Bo's scent same old twilight. Miss Banner passed some quizzes back when the class was almost done. She handed me one to give to the girl. I glanced at the top automatically, 100%, and I'd been spelling her name wrong in my head. It was Edith, not Edith. The gym teacher, Coach Clap. What is in got the? Edith tries to get her biology class swap, doesn't, etc. I'm not hand-holding. Chapter two, open book. Edith ain't at school. Bo cooks for Charlie. That's, Maya's done her bit for women this century. You should see the doctor, Charlie said laughing. It's a good thing she's happily married. A lot of the hospital staff have a hard time concentrating on their work with her around. I'm not sure if I ever picked up on this in my original Twilight video, but wouldn't this be some kind of like workplace hazard waiting to happen? Being so enamored or gobsmacked by a vampire's supernatural beauty that you accidentally do a CPR too hard and kill someone. Don't you think it's funny how Maya wrote Twilight with Bella's perspective and then Twilight with Edward's perspective? and has now gender swapped Twilight from Bella's perspective, but Bella is now Bo. All Maya needs to do now is write life and death from Edith's perspective. Then we will have truly come full circle. The curse will be complete. The stars will align and the worlds will end. Thank God. Nobody could milk anything as much as Maya as milk Twilight. Stephanie Maya could be a dairy farmer because nobody has milked anything as much as Stephanie Mayer has milked Twilight, with one exception. People greeted me in the parking lot Monday morning. I didn't know all their names, but I smiled at everyone. Well, it's nice to see that Bo is just as self-absorbed as Bella. Edith has returned. They go to science class. Edith talks to Bo. It's too bad about the snow, isn't it? Edith asked. I had the odd feeling that she was forcing herself to make small talk with me. It was like she heard my conversation with Jeremy at lunch and was trying to prove me wrong, which was impossible. I was turning paranoid. Maya didn't bother to fix the whole Bo, Bella is way too perceptive complaint. Maybe it was just a complaint by me then. The convo after that is exactly the same chapter three phenomenon. You know, Edith saves him from the MVP of Twilight, that van that spun out of control. I saw you. Everything around us was confusion. I could hear the lower voices of our adults arriving on the scene, but I suddenly held on to the argument. I was right and she was going to admit it. It reads a little bit differently when gender swaps, right? Because as a boy, he just sounds a bit arrogant, stubborn and annoying. I was right, I'm gonna prove her wrong, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, go mansplain somewhere else. Then a doctor walked around the corner and my mouth fell open. She was young, she was blonde and she was more beautiful than any movie star I'd ever seen. Like someone sliced up Audrey Hepburn, Grace Kelly and Marilyn Monroe. Yeah, sure. A straight teenage boy from the 2000s would think of Audrey Hepburn and Grace Kelly. Would it be more realistic if he'd said she looked like Megan Fox? Chapter four, invitations. I'm not bothering to summarize what's going on. Go watch the other video, like side by side with this. So all of the girls ask Bo to prom, which is somehow even less believable now that everyone is gender swapped. But he ends up having something like six secret admirers, Edith reveals, which, Really, for a plain looking generic bloke with no personality. Mm, weirder things have happened. It'd be more prudent for you not to be my friend, she explained, but I'm tired of staying away from you, Bo. So Bo has given us absolutely nothing personality wise. 
much like Bella. And yet, a beautiful woman being obsessed with an average man is kind of believable. Edward, at this point, was already obsessed with Bella. And a beautiful man being obsessed with an average woman, where's that Hollywood film? That's all I'm saying. Like in Hollywood, you, you sure do see a lot of schmucks, right? Pulling beautiful women. Behave. Chapter five, blood type. And then the thin, strong arm was under both of mine and I was on my feet without realising how I got there. The strong arm, cold like the sidewalk, held me tight against the slim body, almost like a crutch. My eyes flipped open in surprise, but all I could see was her tangled bronze hair against my chest. She started moving forward and my feet fumbled, trying to catch up. I expected to fall, but she somehow kept me upright. She didn't so much as stagger when my full weight tugged us both forward. See, I wondered how she was going to do this scene, the whole Edward carrying Bella thing from the class. I feel like Stephanie Mayer is a very traditional woman with traditional values. And I also figured it wouldn't be very, you know, masculine for Bo if he was being carried around in Edith's arms. But saying that, she's propping him up. Edward could have kind of done the same thing for Bella. He didn't have to go into the full, I'm going to carry you like when a couple gets married and they kick the door down to their house. Do you know what I mean? Like the end of that film with the sailors... Or, or the, the the man takes the woman out of the factory. Okay, I didn't actually see the film, but I saw that The Simpsons did a parody of like this scene one time. Hey, what do I tell the boss? Tell him I'm going to the back seat of my car with a woman I love, and I won't be back for 10 minutes. Where are you going? She asked, surprised. Her little hand had a fistful of my jacket. So this bit, Maya did change because in the original, Edward is outraged, being like, where do you think you're going? And drags Bella to his car, like pulling her back, forcing her in. But in this, Edith just kind of goes, where are you going? Doesn't pull him, just goes, like stops him, being like, where are you going? Come to my car. He's, he's like, fine. Are you going to put up a fuss? She asked when I didn't speak. Is there any point in resisting? I tried to decipher all the layers to her smile, but I didn't get very far. It warms my cold heart to see you learning so quickly. This way. She dropped her fistful of jacket and turned. I followed her willingly. The smooth roll of her hips <laughs> was just as hypnotic as her eyes. And there wasn't a downside to getting more time with her. So in this version, Edith makes it clear that she wants Bo to go with her, but it's way less forceful and more flirtatious. Did Maya actually listen to the criticism of Edward manhandling Bella? Or does, and this is more likely I think, does she think that women shouldn't be able to manhandle men because it would be emasculating and, and not sexy, right? A woman bossing a man, it's not sexy. Even though some people are into that, but no, to a traditional woman with traditional values is not, so I think it's the latter. My mum, she's very young for her age. I think Phil makes her feel even younger. Anyway, she's crazy about him. Personally, I didn't see it, but does anyone ever think anyone was good enough for his mum? Well, boy mum, mum boy, mummy boy. I don't really remember them clearly. Kareen and Ernest have been my parents for a long time now. I was actually, like, I made this face when I read that. Shocked, bamboozled, hoodwinked. Karine and Ernest. Maya shouldn't be allowed to like name anything, not even her kids. Chapter six, scary stories. So Jacob Black became Julie Black, also known as Jules. That's fine, that's completely inoffensive. And from what I can tell, all right, this is where I got the second, the original copy up and I was doing the moss thing a little bit because from what I can tell, and my eyes did glaze over a little bit like a Krispy Kreme donut, not gonna lie. Bo didn't flirt with Julie to get information about the Cullens out of her. They just hung out and she told him. He didn't try it on with her. He didn't lead her on, nothing like that. So it's not a complete redoing of Twilight. There's an alternative universe ending, right? At the end of this. So that would be why Bo doesn't flirt with Jules and there's she's not interested in him in that way because it wouldn't match up with the ending anyway. Chapter seven, nightmare. Bo has a nightmare and Jules still turns into a wolf in this version, even though it's slamming you over the head with foreshadowing. 
With a sigh, I turned to my computer, already feeling stupid before I could even finish typing the word. So Maya got rid of the bit where Bella closes all of the pop-ups on her computer. I think she finally realized this meant that Bella's computer had a virus. I had a small collection of my favorite books that I brought to Forks, and now I grabbed 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, plus an old quilt from the linen cupboard at the top of the stairs. So she's changed this from Jane Austen because Jane Austen is just for chicks, am I right, Maya? Bo! I've said I've already said this a bunch of times. He has less personality than Bay Be- than Maya, and I no, not the Maya. I love her than Bella. I don't know how Maya did it. The never-ending chagrin and the obsessiveness of Bella was really annoying, and yet, admittedly, that was more than what we've been given with Bo. Chapter eight, Port Angeles. On the shopping trip, when. Bo goes off alone to look for a bookstore. He accidentally happens upon six people who were either stealing things or taking drugs. It's, it's not really clear. One of them has a gun and Bo gets mistaken for a cop. Hey, pig. A woman's voice called out behind me. Ooh. Maya's getting political. It's the people that he knocked into at the airport all of the way at the beginning of the book. You think I'm stupid? The woman asked. You think your plain clothes get up fools me? I saw you with your cop partner, Vice. What? No, that was my dad, I said, and my voice broke. She laughed. You're just a baby pig? It's called a piglet, Sharon. Maybe you should go back to school and learn what animals are. They threatened to beat him with a pipe to death because a gun would be too noisy, but he gets rescued by Edith. Now, this is different from the original one. We'll get to it at the end. Also, in the original one, Edward drives off and has to be like distract me or else I'm gonna kill them whereas in this Edith fully like tries to get out the car to just kill them and Bo has to continually put his hand upon her to stop her not like it would actually stop her because she's a vampire and she could snap him like that but he has to keep being like no please leave it let's go they go to the restaurant fine Royal has a jacket in the trunk I'll be right she started to move and I reached out trying to catch her hand to keep her there she evaded my grasp folding her hands under the table but didn't get up if this book wasn't a redo of Twilight I wouldn't notice this and I wouldn't care but I do think it's funny how much more forward Bo is with physical touch than Bella was who has always just been like manhandled by everyone and it's quite obvious why there's a difference Bo's a boy so he's allowed to be she pushed the basket of breadsticks towards me I'm not going into shock, I told her. Humor me, she said. And then she did that thing with the smile and the eyes that always won. Ugh, I grumbled as I grabbed a breadstick. Good boy, she... What? I fumbled for my wallet. Um, let me... You didn't even get anything. My treat, bow. But try not to get caught up in antiquated gender roles. That is rich. Chapter nine, theory. I took her hand and she curled her fingers very lightly around mine for one short second and then dropped her hand back to the gear shift. Carefully, I placed my hand over the top of hers again. I ran my thumb along the outside of her hand, tracing her from wrist to the tip of her pinky finger. Her skin was so soft, not that it had any give at all, no, but soft like satin, smoother even. Why are they more immediately touchy-feely than Bella and Edward? ever was that would be like second base for Bella and Edward Edith is also a lot less emotional than Edward a lot less chagrined she's still moody but not nearly as bad I stared into her eyes and it was like she was a magnet again like she was trying to pull me towards her and I had no power to resist I didn't want to try the word vampire was still there between us but it was easier to ignore than I would have thought possible her face was so unbearably perfect it hurt in a strange way to look at it At the same time, I never wanted to look away. I wanted to know if her lips were as silky smooth as the skin of her hand. Suddenly her left hand was there, palm forward, an inch from my face, warning me back and she was cringing against the car door, her eyes wide and frightened, her teeth clenched together. They are also a lot less cautious than Edward and Bella, more immediately sexually charged. Could it be that Maya saw the criticisms of Bella having no bodily autonomy, her sexuality being policed, etc, etc, and wanted to rectify that? Or maybe it's just that Bo is a teenage boy, so he deserves to have all the stuff that Bella didn't have. Well, Bella took four books getting to because Maya is a boy mum and girls, girls don't get a hoardy. Here's a comparison of the two texts for you. About three things I was absolutely positive. First, Edward was a vampire. Second, there was a part of him and I didn't know how potent that part might be that thirsted for my blood. And third, I was unconditionally and irrevocably in love with him. There were a few things I knew for sure. For one, Edith was an actual vampire. For another, there was a part of her that saw me as food. But in the end, none of that mattered. 
All that mattered was that I loved her more than I'd ever imagined it was possible to love anything. She was everything I wanted, the only thing I would ever want. She's not a thing, is she? So Bo is definitely a bit dimmer than Bella, but Bella was a walking thesaurus word vomiter anyway, so I, I don't know which one is worse. Chapter 10, interrogations. Compare the two texts again. She wants to know if we're secretly dating and she wants to know how you feel about me, Edward says about Jess. She grinned a mischievous smile. He wants to know if we're secretly dating and exactly which base you've gotten to with me. See, girls aren't allowed to be horny. They must be chaste. They must not talk about sexual acts, but boys, pff, who cares? This is one of those instances where I just know the original Twilight so well that I, that I just know when Maya has deviated from Edward's original dialogue. It's embarrassing. It's embarrassing. I shouldn't know Twilight at all. I should have got on with my life like everyone else my age did when they got over Twilight. Take for example this next bit. Um, what should I say? She started walking and I followed, not paying attention to where she was leading. After a second she looked up at me, her face relaxed and smiling again. That's a good question. I can't wait to hear what you come up with. Original. Hmm. He paused to catch a stray lock of hair that was escaping the twist on my neck and wound it back into place. My heart spluttered hyperactively. I suppose you could say yes to the first, if you don't mind. It's easier than the other explanation, than any other explanation. Regarding them secretly dating. So notice how Edith doesn't tell Bo to say that they are secretly dating because that wouldn't be ladylike of her. What was that about gender and antiquated stuff again, Maya? So the conversation that Bo and Jeremy, who is Jess in this, is annoying. With Bella and Jessica, it was all about how much she likes Edward and how he's more than a pretty face and oh, but she couldn't possibly like me, blah, blah, blah. It, I'm ashamed to say, had some depth compared to this. But with Jeremy, it's just basically, did you score? Bet she's only going out of you because of pity. Okay. He started flipping <clears throat> through his book, trying to figure out what she'd asked him. Maya, this book came out in 2015. You can't say that anymore. You can actually, who am I to tell you what you can and can't do, but some people just might not like it. Do what you want, people might judge you. You're not sitting with us at lunch today, are you? His face was suspicious again and more guarded now. Obviously he thought I'd be eager to show off, to sell Edith out to make myself look cooler. After all, Jeremy and I had been friends for a little while. Guys told each other this kind of stuff. It was probably part of the man code thing I'd invented. He'd assumed my loyalty would be with him, but now he knew he was wrong. So Jess gets excited for Bella and the gossip that'll come out of Bella spending lunch with Edward. Yeah, she looks forward to hearing about it. Meanwhile, Jeremy just gets like really pissy. Interesting. He walked off without waiting for me, but then he did a little stutter step and paused on the threshold of the classroom. Seriously, what the hell? Jeremy said loud enough that I could hear him, as did everyone else within a 10 foot radius. He acted that way just because Edith was waiting for Bo outside the classroom. Jess seems a lot nicer in comparison now. Her forehead creased. After a second, she hesitantly stretched her arm across the table towards me, leaving her hand in easy reach. I covered it with mine. It's funny that they're so much more comfortable with each other like physically than Bella and Edward because they've actually interacted and spoken a lot. The interactions are the same, but the conversations they've had, they, they've spoken a lot less than Edward and Bella did originally, who would just go on for like pages and pages and pages about their bloody feelings. Many different reactions, her forehead wrinkled again. Royal has a particularly strident mental voice. Do you reckon Royal is yelling nonce with his mind as loud as he can? Do you reckon any of the vampires thought Edith and Edward were being a little bit sus. Also, Royal and Eleanor are being pissy of Edith and glowering at her and then she bears her teeth back. They're more territorial in this. Why? Did I just piss off, I swallowed before I could finish, a bunch of vampires? No, she said fiercely, then sighed. But I did. Chapter 11, complications. Charlie left them with a goodbye wave and I went upstairs to brush my teeth and gather my books. When I heard the cruiser pull away, I could only wait a few seconds before I had to look out my window. The silver car was already there, waiting in Charlie's spot in the driveway. I took the stairs three at a time and was out the door in seconds. I wondered how long this strange routine would continue. I never wanted it to end. On one hand, it's a very teenager thing to do, to sneak around behind a parent's back, etc. Fine, whatever. But the implications change a little bit. The dynamics are shifted when one of the teenagers is actually like a hundred years old. Doesn't sound great then, does it? Sneaking around, not telling your parents, hanging out with a centurion when you're a teen. So in this book, Taylor, originally Tyler, has insisted that Bo is taking her to the girl 
dance thing. So Bo does this melodramatic acting scene to get her and Logan off his back. And Maya wrote this because Bella never bothers to confront Tyler, I think, in the original. I'm tired of being a pawn in your game, Taylor. Do you even realize that I have feelings of my own? And all I can do is watch while you use me to get someone else jealous. My eyes darted quickly to Logan, whose mouth was hanging open, and back to Taylor. You don't care if you break my heart in the process. Is it being beautiful that's made you so cruel? Maya, stop trying to be funny. Leave it to the professionals. He storms out the cafeteria in a fake huff, and somehow that works. Taylor's like, oh, he he, feels like a femme fatale. Maybe stick to the original plot points, Maya. Chapter 12, balancing. She smiled. You're not like anyone I've ever known, Bo. You fascinate me. Part of me was sure she was making fun of me. The part that couldn't escape the fact that I was the most boring person I knew. He is pretty boring, but then again, beautiful women hanging out with mid-men is nothing new. I promised to try to be safe, I recited. I was meaning to deal with the laundry, or is that too hazardous a task? I mean, I could fall in or something. Her eyes narrowed. Okay, okay, I'll do my best. That's this one. Here's the original. I promised to try to be safe, I recited. I'll do the laundry tonight. That ought to be fraught with peril. Don't fall in, he mocked. Maya, you can't recycle your own joke to attempt to make Bo funnier than Bella. Well, you can, but I'm going to judge you for it. I knew I would never get to sleep with all this crazy in my head, so I did something I'd never done before. I deliberately took unnecessary cold medicine, the kind that knocked me out for a good eight hours. You didn't think of redacting this changing it to i had a cup of warm milk put on like those television shopping adverts no i'd never seen so much of her skin her pale arms her slim shoulders the fragile looking twigs of her collarbones the vulnerable hollows above them the swan-like column of her neck the gentle swell of her breast don't stare don't stare and the ribs i could nearly count under the thin cotton she was too perfect i realized with a crushing wave of despair there was no way this goddess could ever belong with me breasts in my Christian vampire novel? I don't think so. Chapter 13, Confessions. The light blazed off her skin, danced in prism like rainbows across her face and neck, down her arms. She was so bright that I had to squim. It's worse than doing a marathon this, honestly. Like tough mud has got nothing on doing this. Like I was trying to stare at the sun. I thought about falling to my knees on purpose. This was the kind of beauty you worshipped. The kind you built temples for and offered sacrifices to. I wished I had something in my empty hands to give her. But what would a goddess want from a mediocre mortal like me? Good lord, get some self-respect. May I kept in the bit where Edward Edith has a tantrum and beats up a tree. She gives him an awkward piggyback, which is awkward because she's so small and he's so tall. Cute. Chapter 14, Mind Over Matter. Sleep is one. Never ending consciousness gets tedious. I think I'd enjoy temporary oblivion. It looks interesting. I said that in my Breaking Dawn video that never ending consciousness sounds like an existential nightmare. It sounds horrible. It's just a day that won't end ever. Edith has been visiting. <laughs> She's like fixed all these like tiny blink and you miss some moments that no like reasonable sane person is going to notice there's only an idiot like me doing something like this is gonna notice right she changed all this like minor crap but has kept in the bits where edith was visiting him whilst he sleeps and he's fine with it he likes it actually they, they talk in bed cuddling she laughed are you asking me about sex Bo? i feel like that's the first time that maya has ever even types that word even outside of twilight you have no idea she said darkly then sighed and now in the specific sense sex and vampires 102 Bo and edith maya this is so forward for her what's gotten into you did you read 50 shades of gray after all can i ask you something now something potentially offensive it's your turn do you have any experience with sex and humans? Miss Mayer has finally grown up. I'm so proud of her. Then she ruins it with this. It was your eyes first. You have lovely eyes, Bo, like a sky of our clouds. I spent my life in rainy climates and so I often miss the sky, but not when I'm with you. Uh, thanks, she giggled. I'm not alone. Six of your ten, it wasn't six, it was ten. Ten admirers started with your eyes too. Ten, ten. this crusty, dusty, like average mid bloke awkward trips up all the time like plain looking dude 10 admirers hmm. chapter 15 the cullens i stared into her eyes i love you i said she leaned down and rests her forehead carefully against mine you are my life now goes on two dates what all did archie see that is not a real sentence chapter 16 kareen so <sighs> Sulpicia. so marcus and 
Athenodora, she said, indicating the other three, nighttime patron of the arts. So this is the new Volturi. Marcus has stayed the same, but Sulpicia and Athenodora. Athenodora, like Athena. Athenodora. <sighs> Chapter 17, the game, you just lost it. I was surprised that she had agreed. That's probably best. Be careful though, the child has no idea. Child? You know, Jules is not that much younger than I am. She looked at me then, her anger gone. She grinned. Oh, I know. Cougar. Bo tells Charlie about Edith and he barely cares because of course he doesn't. Bo is a boy. Dads are only allowed to get like angry, territorial and emotionally ancestral over their daughters. Well, I sort of have a date with Edward Cullen tonight and he wants to introduce me to his parents. Dad? It appeared that Charlie was having an aneurysm. Dad, are you all right? You're going out of Edward Cullen, he thundered. Uh-oh, I thought you liked the Cullens. He's too old for you, he ranted, compared. Well, I sort of have a date with Edith Cullen tonight and she wanted to introduce me to her parents. He stared at me like I just announced that I spent the day knocking over liquor stores. What, Dad? Didn't you just tell me that you wanted me to socialize? He blinked a few times, then picked up his fork. Yeah, guess I did. Doesn't give one solitary shit. You sound like my dad, I laughed. He laughed too. Well, I do think of them as my children and, oh, this is Ernest. <laughs> the lack of context is getting to me too. Well, I do think of them as my children in most ways, but I could never get over. He broke off and then took a deep breath. Did Edith tell you that I lost my daughter? Uh, no, I murmured, stunned, scrabbling to understand what lifetime he was remembering. My only child, my grace. She died when she was barely two. It broke my heart. That's why I jumped off the cliff, you know, he added calmly. Did you put your name into the goblet of fire, Harry? Dumbledore asked calmly. Harry, you put your name in a couple of fire. I know this is in the original, but like random trauma dump alert. Cheers, Ernest. Very cool. Grace would have grown into such an amazing person. He looked at me and smiled warmly. I'm so happy she found you, Bo. She's been the odd man out for far too long. It's hurt to see me there alone. And in the original, it was, yeah, Edward's been the odd man out for too long, right? So I think like in this context, would an odd one out sound better considering Edith as a is a woman? She's been the odd man out, or did I catch a mistake? Like, God, I'm so good. Chapter 18, The Hunt. Chapter 19, goodbyes. Charlie ran after me and grabbed the strap on my bag, calling me back a step. Are you doing drugs, Bo? He demanded. That would make Bo more interesting. I'll tell you what happened, I said in the hardest voice I could imagine. I had a great night with the prettiest girl I've ever seen, and we talked about the future, the way she sees it. It's just like you. She's going to stay here the rest of her life. She's going to get married, have kids, and never leave. And for a second, that all actually made sense to me. I'm losing myself here. I'm getting sucked in. If I don't run now, I'll never get out. Just let me go, Charlie, I said through my teeth. I threw the door open. It didn't work out, okay? I really, really hate forks. The cruel words did their job. Charlie's hand dropped from my bag. So I found this diatribe less believable than Bella's. Maybe because Bo isn't that believable as a character. However, I did find it more believable that Charlie would let go, let Bo go because he's a boy. Like he's what, 17? Which sounds bad. I think he should have stopped him from going regardless. But I can't really imagine a father who, who loves his teenage daughter just letting her drive across the country at night time while she's upset. And while, yes, it, I think it... <laughs> I don't know, I just think a dad would, I, I think Charlie, if he loved Bella, he wouldn't have let her just do that. I think if he loved Bo, he shouldn't have let him do that. Like, But it's, what's it called? It's a canon event, but it's more believable that Charlie just lets him go. Chapter 20, Impatience. Maya said at the beginning that she didn't realize at the time how much more of a role Alice slash Charlie should have had. And so far, up until now, nothing about that changed. Like it was just the same old Alice but as Archie, until he grinned. It's hard to explain about sounding slightly schizophrenic. Time doesn't mean the same thing to me that it does to you or Jess or anyone else. Jessamine grinned and tweaked his ear. So this won't make sense to you. But for me, it's like we've already been friends for a long time, Bo. The first second you became a part of Edith's life, for me, it was like we'd already spent hundreds of hours together. We've laughed at Edith's overreactions together. I think like that would make relationships so boring though. You just, you've already seen whatever we laughed at edith's overreactions together we've annoyed royal right out the house together we stayed up to all night talking with kareen together i stared he shrugged it's how i experienced the world we're friends i asked my voice for the wonder best friends he told me someday it was nice of my favorite sister don't you think to fall in love with my best friend i guess i owe her that one that's one of the monumental changes between archie and alice like maya's really out here giving us crumbs and thinking we're well fed the hair 
He ran a hand over his scalp, unselfconscious. The stopper was just long enough to see that his hair would have been dark brown, nearly black like his eyebrows. It was a rather extreme look for 1920. A little early for me to have been a skinhead, thank heavens. My best guess is disease or bad behaviour. So I've wondered about this, right? As their bodies are frozen, does the hair grow? Obviously not, right? Or Archie would have longer hair. So if their hair gets ripped off during a fight, is it gone forever? Because I guess if the... Yeah. I guess the only thing strong enough to do that to you would be another vampire. But imagine you get into like a fight with another vampire down at like the local dive blood bar bank and they grab a piece of your hair and rip it out and then that's it. You just got what got no air for the rest of like a, a patch of hair gone for the rest of eternity. Also, do they all have pubes? What if they wanted to get rid of the pubes, right? Maybe they like to smooth canvas down there, yeah? Would they have to rip them out? I'm asking the real questions here. Stephanie Mayer, when you do this, but from Edith's perspective, can you tell us whether the vampires have pubes? See, what if there were vampires born in a time where like they just let their armpit hair grow? Would they rip them out? They're all chatting in this chapter more than they did in the original. For everyone else, the pain of transformation is the sharpest memory they have their human life. I don't know why I'm different. Archie stared past me motionless. I wondered what it would be like to not know who you were, to look in the mirror and not recognize the person looking back. It's irrelevant at this point. Alice is like 80 years old, human for roughly the first 14 years of her life. If she's not over it at this point, she needs therapy. They all need therapy. Chapter 21, phone call. The tracker rings bow. Mom, please listen to me, I pleaded. I walked slowly through the bedroom door, feeling Archie's worried stare on my back. I shut the door behind me, trying to think clearly through the terror that immobilized my brain. There now, are you alone? Just answer yes or no. Yes. They can still hear you, I'm sure. Yes. All right then, the agreeable voice continued. Say, Mum, trust me. You know how OP Maya makes her vampires? How they can just hear things from like miles away? You're telling me that Jessamine and Archie couldn't hear someone's voice talking on a phone. If someone was in the same room as me right now and they answered a phone call, I would hear that person on the other side being like, hello, but they, bollocks. Chapter 22, hide and seek. She was standing a few feet away from me, arms folded, looking at me curiously. There was no menace in her expression or stance. She was so average looking, nothing remarkable at her face or body at all. So which is it, Maya? Are all vampires fitties or not? Which is it? Because I thought like they all had to be fit because that's part of being a vampire. So the tracker vampire Joss monologues like James does. I didn't answer. My bravado was wearing off. I could tell she was coming to the end of her monologuing, which I didn't get the point of anyway. Why explain it to me? Where was the glory in beating some weak human? I didn't feel the need to rub it into every cheeseburger I conquered. Mayor, if you think the monologuing is stupid, then don't include it. She took a step back and touched a palm-sized digital video camera balanced carefully on top of the stereo. A small red light indicated that it was already running. She adjusted it a few times, widened the frame. I don't think she'll be able to resist hunting me after she watches this. So this explained the gloating. It wasn't for me. Maya added this bit. Maya has clearly been reading the criticisms and decided to change only the minor details like that. Not the whole stalking in the bedroom, not the whole other weird stuff. Joss breaks Bo's arm and legs and ribs and bites him. Chapter 23, the choice. Bo gets rescued by the Cullens. However, it's too late, Archie said. We got here too late. You can see it, Kareen said in a more subdued voice. There are only two futures left, Kareen. He survives as one of us, or Edith kills him trying to stop it from happening. And this is where we actually differ from the original Twilight. And the basis of this is that Bo escaped from the airport five minutes earlier than Bella did. Hence the venom spread too much. It was too late. And also I think he got bashed up way more than Bella did as well. I don't think she, did she get her arm and her ribs broken? Who knows? They give Bo the choice to die or to live as a vampire. And he chooses life, of course. Duh. So Edith bites him to help speed up the process. Chapter 24, change. I ended up changing my mind. The fire in my arm wasn't really so bad. The worst thing I'd ever felt up to that point, yes, but not the same as my entire body on fire. I begged her to make it stop. I told her that this was really all I wanted for the burning to stop, nothing else. I heard Archie telling her that everyone had said the same thing, reminding her that she'd begged Kareen to, tell, to kill her too. Telling her my first decision was the one that counted. I remembered at one point screaming at him to shut up. I think he apologized. Um, rude. When Bella was transforming, she didn't make a single peep. She didn't move a muscle because women should always be in perfect control of themselves. Do better, Bo. I suppose that's a very small thing though. I should focus on the most important things, the hard things, the very worst thing. Oh, I'm so sorry, Bo. You can't see your father or mother again. It's not safe. I know Maya wanted to investigate the alternative of Twilight ending, but it kind of feels like you just sort of hate Bo a bit. 
Because Bella, not just May as a boy mum, Bella ends up getting everything that she wanted. Whereas, who cares about this guy? Then we get some info dumping. They're called the Volturi. They are, for the lack of a better word, the police of our world. I'll tell you more about them in a bit. You just need to know that they exist so I can explain to you why you can't tell Charlie or your mother where you are. You can't talk to them again, Bo. Her voice was straining higher like it was about to fracture. It's best. We don't have much choice but to let them think you're dead. I'm so sorry. You didn't even get to say goodbye. It's not fair. She told me about the people I'd seen in the painting with Corrine, the Volturi, how they joined forces during the Mycenaean age and begun a millennia long campaign to create peace and order in the vampire world, how there had been six of them in the beginning, how betrayal and murder had cut them in half. Someone named Aro had murdered his sister, his best wife's friend. Nope, his best friend's wife. I'm tired, leave me alone. The best friend was Marcus. He was the man I'd seen standing with Corrine. Aro's own wife, Sulpicia. The one with Sulpicia, whatever. The one with, it doesn't matter, they literally aren't canon. The one with all the masses of dark hair in the painting had been the only witness. She turned him over to Marcus and their soldiers. There had been some question of what to do. Arrow had a very powerful extra gift, like what Edith had, but more, she said, and the Volturi weren't sure they'd be able to succeed without him. But Sulpicia had searched out the young girl, Meli, Meli, Mel. The one Edith had called a servant and a thief who had a gift of her own. She could absorb another vampire's gift. She couldn't use that stolen gift herself, but she could give it to someone else who she was touching. So Pitchia had Melly take Arrow's gift and then Marcus executed him. Maya, stop making stuff up. I know that all stories are made up, but not like this. She told me stories to fill the time and the others took turns helping her. Corrine sat on the ground next to me and told me the most amazing story about Jules' family, that her great grandmother had actually been a werewolf. All the things Jules had scoffed about were straight history. Corrine told me she'd promised them that she would never bite another human. It was part of the treaty between them, the treaty that meant the Cullens could never go due west to the ocean. So we just get info dumped, info dumped all over us. All of the Cullens dump their backgrounds onto Bo whilst he's still changing to distract him from the pain. But it's like four books worth of summaries within a few paragraphs. I bet Maya felt slick, but it does feel rushed. Even Royal took a turn. He told me about a life consumed with vanity, with material things, with ambition. He told me about the only daughter of a powerful man, exactly what kind of power this man wielded, Royal hadn't entirely understood, and how Royal had planned to marry her and become heir to the dynasty, how the beautiful daughter pretended to love him to please her father, and then how she'd watched when her lover from a rival criminal syndicate had beaten Royal to death, how she'd laughed aloud the whole time. He told me the revenge he'd gotten. Royal was the least careful of his words. He told me about losing his family and how none of this was worth what he'd lost. So can we just admit that Royal slash Rosalie's true love obviously isn't Emmett slash Eleanor, seeing as Royal and by extension Rosalie feels like this. Also mate, not me funny, it was decades ago, go to therapy. Also, Rosalie wanted her own kids, right? So in a way, her life was still superficial and still full of vanity to mope around for decades, wanting to choose imaginary children over the vamp, over the family, family, like vampire family, that actually exist for her, the Cullens. And nothing was stopping her from adopting a child, but I guess it wouldn't count to her because it's not her DNA because she's vain and self-absorbed. So realistically, Rosalie actually had zero character development or growth throughout the entirety of the Twilight Saga. Kareen walked into the room and the amazing part about that was that I actually heard her. Edith and her family never made any noise when they moved, but now if I listened, I could hear the low sound of Kareen's lips brushing together as she spoke. Bella said that about Edward in Breaking Dawn when she changed, which number one, just sounds annoying to be able to hear that much. Number two, Stephanie Mayer, environmental queen, recycling all of her material. She leaned into my touch, put her hand over mine and held it against her face. It was strange because it was familiar. I'd always loved it when she'd done that. Why is he talking like they were dating for years, not just one weekend? Okay, I said. In the car, I wanted to tell you that you didn't need to apologize. I felt horrible that you were so sad. This isn't your fault. She started to say something, so I put my finger over her lips. And it isn't all bad, I continued. I'm, well, my head is still spinning and I know there are a million things to think about and I'm sad, of course, but I'm also good, Edith. I'm always good when I'm with you. Yeah, who cares about Charlie and Renee, am I right? As long as Bo gets to have vampire sex with his hot vampire GF. Yes, it's hard. It's going to be hard for a long time. Maybe forever, right? But why would I put that onto you? Joss is the one who, well, killed me. You brought me back to life. She pushed my hand down. If I hadn't involved you in my world, I laughed and she looked up at me like I'd lost my mind. Edith, if you hadn't involved me in your world, Charlie and Renee would have lost me three months earlier from that van. So I guess when you become a vampire, you also get superhuman logic. 
what a brilliant ability to be able to rise over the emotion that surely this scene warrants. You're never going to see your parents again. But also, no, there's a flaw in that because all Twilight vampires are so overly emotional. They're always trying to kill each other over literally nothing. Bo still has the superhuman control of his first, like Bella. We ran together into the darkness that wasn't dark and I was unafraid. This would be easy, I knew. Just like everything else. Oh well, that's all right then. Epilogue, an occasion. Bo goes to his own funeral, I guess because there was just nothing else to do that day. Nothing on the TV. The hearse was overkill. There hadn't been enough of the body that they'd found inside the burned out shell of my truck to need a casket. I didn't know the stranger's name. I hadn't wanted to know every detail about how Archie and Eleanor had faked my death. I just knew that someone roughly my size who had been recently interred had taken one last trip. I assumed that all the identifiers had been destroyed, teeth, prints, etc. I felt pretty bad for the guy, but I suppose he didn't mind. He hadn't felt anything when the truck veered into a ravine somewhere in Nevada and burst into flames. His family had already mourned. They had a tombstone with his name on it, like my parents had now. So the Cullens stole a corpse from a grave. Kareen spent more time with Charlie. I knew she was apologizing for Edith's absence, explaining that she'd been too distraught to come. This was more than just an excuse for Edith to be with me today. It was laying the groundwork for the next school year when Edith was continued to be so distraught that Ernest would decide to homeschool her. Wow, they think of everything. So I've got an alternative universe for you guys. What if Charlie blames the Cullens for Bo's death, you know, blames the Cullens for Bo running away in the first place, blames Edith, etc., but then finds out who and what they really are and then becomes a vampire hunter. Now, I don't know how a human could possibly kill a vampire in this universe, but it's just an idea. Bo thinks Bonnie sees them, but it's a false alarm, maybe. Or Jules could still turn into a werewolf and then she becomes a vampire hunter to avenge Bo's mysterious death, but then finds out he faked it and then gets annoyed and they kill each other. There's just, I'm just seeing what grows. Sowing seeds. I'm so sorry, Bo. I never wanted this for you. I just nodded. We sat like that for a long time. She nudged me when Charlie left so I could watch him drive away. That's actually sad. So in a way, there's finally some consequence to the main character for being a vampire. Original Twilight for Bella had zero consequences. She got everything that she wanted, even a baby that she didn't even know that she wanted. This sadder ending is a bit more realistic as far as super, this story can be realistic and heavier. So it's a bit better than the original, I think, just because like there is a bit of sacrifice that has had to be made. And look, I don't want Charlie to be sad because book one Charlie is the best Charlie out of the lot, but she sighed. Best case scenario, I hoped that I would get strong enough that we could be together while you were human, that we could be something more than boyfriend and girlfriend. Someday, if you didn't outgrow me, more than just husband and wife, we wouldn't be able to grow old together, but I would have stayed with you while you grew old. I would have been with you all through the years of your life. She paused for a second. And then when your life was over, I wouldn't have wanted to stay without you. I would have found a way to follow. That sounds stupid, mate. That was a really, really horrible idea, I told her. Can you imagine? When people thought I was your dad, your granddad, I'd probably get locked up. Oh my God, Mia, is this self-awareness? Anyway, he proposes, she says yes. She leaned back to look at me. Her face was sad again. Any other way ended here too. But there could have been a better goodbye. I didn't want to think about what my last words to Charlie were, but they were constantly on my mind. It was the biggest regret I had. I was glad the memory wasn't sharp and I only hoped it would fade more time. It is never, ever, ever going to fade for Charlie. He's going to spend the rest of his life wishing he'd stopped Bo from leaving, but who cares about Charlie, am I right? As long as it fades away for Bo and he gets to have vampire sex with his hot vampire wife. What if we had gotten married, you know, graduated together, put in a few years at a college, then had a great big wedding when we invited everyone we knew. Let them see us all happy together, give really sappy speeches, have a reason to tell everyone how much we love them, then go away again, back to the school somewhere far away. She sighed. That sounds nice, but you would end up with a double funeral in the end. Maybe, maybe we'd be really busy for a year. And when I'm a mature vampire and all under control, I could see them again. Right, she said, rolling her eyes. And then all we have to worry about is never aging and getting on the bad side of the Volturi. I'm sure that would end well. Okay, okay, you're right. There is no other version. I think she's trying to be like so meta here. Who are you trying to kid? They get a phone call from Kareen and go back to the house. Three werewolves have shown up. It's Sam thinking the treaty has been broken because Bo has turned. Of course, Bo uses the power of words to de-escalate the situation like Maya does with everything. Remember how I said that Bo is the dumber version of Bella. Listen to this. Right, I looked at the wolf again, trying to picture the tall woman somehow inside it. Uh, a few weeks ago, there was a tracker, uh, a vampire tracker who came through here. She liked the way I smelled. 
The Cullens told her to back off. She left, but Edith knew she was planning to try to kill me. I went back to Phoenix to hide out so the Cullens could, well, take care of her, you know? But the tracker figured out where I was and caught up to me. It was just, it was a game to her, a game of the Cullens. I was just a pawn. But she didn't want to just kill me. She, I guess you could say she was playing with her food. The Cullens found me before she could kill me, but she'd already bit at me. Hey, do we still have the video? I glanced over at Edith, who was staring at the walls. She shook her head. I turned back to Sam. That's too bad. The tracker was filming the whole thing. I could have shown you exactly what happened. If I was Sam, I'd have killed Bo for wasting my time with that boring and unarticulate speech. Bella is a lot more articulate than that. They go off to meet Bonnie to have her decide upon their fate. Bonnie literally just gets over it. Once Bo is like, hi, I'm still me. She's like, oh, okay, whatever. What a, and she even says sorry to them. She's like, oh, sorry for the business. What a simp. Bell, Bo accidentally smells Bonnie and is all, oh my God, it's the most tasteous thing I've ever smelled. It's like I was living on stale crackers and someone had the most perfectly cooked filet mignon in front of me. Oh my God. But then he also just gets over it literally half a second later. You could really tell that she was running out of pages. If I began, will you ever tell Jules about any of this? I looked at the enormous walls flanking Bonnie. Or will it always be a secret? I didn't understand the look that crossed her face now. Jules will know soon enough. Oh, okay. Well, if she can know about me, can you tell her I'm happy? It's not so bad, this whole vampire thing. I mean, I knew you were a special beau, but that was something back there. Jasmine's not going to believe it. <sighs> Talking about his bloodlust that he can control, but She wrapped her arms around my neck. Then here I will stay. Forever, I said. Forever, she agreed. I leaned down until my lips found hers. Forever was going to be amazing. And that's the end of Twilight, Light and Death. But don't go yet, because there's an afterword. I know it's a lot to expect you to read. You can say that again, Maya. But let me be quick to say, the fact that Bo becomes a vampire has nothing to do at all with the fact he is a boy, not a girl. Rubbish. Bollocks. Women vampires can't get pregnant. So there was no need for Bo to wait around until after marriage. There's a lot of happiness in Bo and Edith coming together in taking away the stumbling block between them so much earlier, but there's also great sadness. As a human, Bella had to endure a lot more pain than Bo did, but in the end, I know she would tell you it was all worth it. Bo will be fine, more than fine. He'll be very happy, but he'll always have the one big regret. Bella was able to put her house in order and she's confident she got the best version of the story. Bella did not endure a lot more pain than Bo. She just complained a lot more, a hundred pages worth more, but she got everything that she wanted in the end. The demon baby, Charlie. I do actually prefer that because of this ending, there's no Renesmee. I do prefer that. And no weird Jules, Jacob, fake love triangle plot as well. Oh God, it's kind of a bit of the superior ending really, isn't it? Again, thank you for everything you've meant to me in the last 10 years. You're very welcome. Can't wait to your next book. So to conclude, to conclude, Bo is just a dimmed down, less emotional version of Bella. Nothing really changed besides the ending. Bo is such an average bloke that even though I joked about beautiful women liking mid men, really it's not realistic that Edith, this beautiful supernatural, would be attracted to a boring, plain dude. At least Bella was all faux intelligent with her, ooh, 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 I love Jane Austen, I'm such an old soul in a 17 year old's body, ooh. The only reason that Edward gets interested in Bella in the first place is because he can't read her mind, but at least she had a little bit more of a personality than Beau. Also, Edward is a creepy old incel, so it's just more believable that he'd get obsessed with Bella. Edith, I just don't find it, I don't find the rom romance believable. However, because Bo is so boring, this book is a good 100 pages shorter than the original Twilight. So that is something. Positive or negative, still yet to be seen, but it is something. There's another change that's worth bringing up. In Port Angeles in the original, Bella almost gets gang assaulted by a group of men. And that has been changed to Bo almost getting killed by gun violence by itself also rosalie's backstory of being gang assaulted by her fiance and fiance's friends is changed to royal almost being beaten to death and i've seen people complain that this shows the originals were using rape and assault as a plot device as an easy give a woman trauma or added depth by having her get assaulted apparently it's a thing that a lot of writers do so and look if one of the assault scenes had been changed like say the bow getting almost killed by gun violence that 
that happens, right? So if, if that had been changed by itself, fine, whatever. But because both of them get changed, I think there's something going on with Steph's thought process about sexual assault and men. So for me, it's worth bringing up at least briefly. I think it's either two things here. Either Stephanie Mayer doesn't understand that men can also be assaulted, though I'm sure she does understand that. So I think it's the latter. No, wait, there's three things. I can't count, there's three things. Either Stephanie Mayer doesn't understand that men can be assaulted, or she's being a bit lazy. She was a bit lazy in the originals by being like, here's some trauma in the form of assault. Or knowing that she's a very traditional God-fearing woman, I wonder if she subconsciously, subconsciously, I'm really giving the benefit of the doubt here, subconsciously believes that it would be emasculating for men to be assaulted because there's a lot of people that do think it's emasculating. Like a lot of people are like, what? But how could a woman sexually assault a man? Like people still say that kind of stuff, right? So potentially maybe she thinks it would be emasculating for a man to be sexually assaulted and that getting beaten up is just maybe more masculine or more manly or like some outdated rubbish. Like, I think there's one of three things going on here. I know which one I think it is. Make up your mind in the comment section below. Again, if it was just one of the, thi one of the scenes that had got changed, I'd probably gone, oh, she changed that, okay. But because it was both, it's a bit like, hmm. And the final thing that is worth noting is on Kindle, this book is one pound more than the original Twilight. So it's more expensive than the original Twilight. And the majority of people who read this and buy this are going to be people who liked the original Twilight. How are you gonna charge people a little bit extra to give them a book that is essentially the same, apart from the pronouns changing, as a book they already have, but then you just added like an extra chapter at the end. The audacity. Was this book a cash grab for the 10th year anniversary? Absolutely, I think so which I love that for her, by the way. I hope she never changes. I can't wait to get life and death from Edith's perspective next. That is the end of this video. Thank you so much for watching. Let me know what you think about it in the comment section below. Let me know if you think I'm just being an absolute waste man, wasting my time. I'm choosing to waste my time on stuff like this. Let me know if you want me to do Midnight Sun next. Remember to follow me on Instagram. Thank you so much to G2A for sponsoring today's video. And that's all. See you next time. Bye.